feel like I should look at the controls, but they're over here. <laughs> I'm trying to like change someone's status to a panelist, but people keep adding and it's like I'm chasing this person down the list to try to, okay, got one. Awesome. Ting. Oh wait, I can do this. You've got Ting. Yes. Hi. Hi, Ting. How are you? Good. How you doing? Peachy. Just a peachy. Is there you know, a disconcerting thing where you can't see people, but you're still nervous because you know they're out there? <laughs> you guys see me? I'm yes, not, I am. How come I'm not seeing you guys? Uh, okay. Just tell like me how to adjust. Just tell me how to adjust my camera. Up, down, left, right. Um, just a little bit up. Perfect. What's that? That's you. You're. You're. Okay. You see the bouquets. Right you see the bouquets behind me a little bit. Yes. Things at the oh. beach. Well, I. How can I? You know, normally you see everybody on the side. I'm not seeing everybody. I see your PowerPoint. Oh, there you are. I found you. Oh no, I, I want to be more. I want to be more this way. I like. I like my books to show. Is that good? I think we're good. All right. Catherine, how many attendees are you expecting? I I have no idea. Um, yesterday they said it was almost two hundred. Okay. But you know, you never know how many people are. Who signed up or who are really going to show up, that kind of thing. Okay, well, just let me know when you want to get started and I'll give everybody the opening information. Um, our time is oh, look here. 232, and we've got 36 part participants right now, including panelists. Okay. Do you want to give them just um, like maybe another minute? Let them in because they're thinking right now they're in the wrong place. And then just Does pause that make when sense? In there. So I, you are letting people in right now, yes? I don't have to let anyone in. Okay. I, I hit broadcast, so everyone is coming along, joining the list of attendees keeps going up. But. Okay. So yeah, we'll just give them a couple seconds. Um, to get out of what they were in and come on over. Uh, so my, my question for you, Adrian, is um, did you get the link for the Dropbox in that email one in in your email like original email but i thought you said you were going to add it do you need me to add it well so because i have the powerpoint up i can't really see it so if you could add that link in the chat the chat okay and if find it. that way if people want to download the uh powerpoint which will be short i promise uh or the discussion questions for themselves, they have them. Okay. All right, we're up to 42 participants and attendees, so. I can all right, let's get started, I think. Sure. Um, um, thank you all for coming to the National Agenda Concurrent Session. Um, if uh, if you need the uh, code for credits, it is policy. Um, and then I'm going to actually put this in the, in the in the chat too, so you can copy and paste anything, follow links, things like that. Awesome, thanks, thanks a lot. Hi, um, I'm Catherine, Catherine Botsford, and uh, I am a co-chair or have been a co-chair on this National Agenda Committee along with um, Brunhild Merck Adams. And uh, Brunhild is also here with us. She needs to pop in and out a little bit, but, uh, but she is here. Um, Usually, this is um, a meeting that happens alongside annual meeting uh, at APH. 
and um, it's around a dozen folks who show up. And so yes, uh, Monday on our practice, um, uh, Leanne pointed out that there were quite a few people registered. Uh, and when I mentioned that to, to Penny and, and Ting, because my idea was that we were gonna talk about um, their work, uh, Penny pointed out I might need to do a little PowerPoint to help people get kind of on the same page with national agenda and what the meeting is. Um, like I said, normally national agenda is a meeting and uh, there's discussion at the meeting and that was my original intent. Um, but I also understand that there are people here who might um, actually be looking for information about the national agenda committee. So I just wanted to take a minute and uh, give you guys that background. If I can get my PowerPoint to work, let's, let's work. Hey, success. All right, so what, what my intent today is, is uh, to give you a brief overview of the national agenda for the education of children and youth with visual impairments, including those with additional disabilities. Um, we're gonna look at the original national agenda's goals. We're gonna look at the current state of the national agenda committee. Um, and then hopefully get into the topical discussions I had planned. And then um, it's probably a really good time to talk about the future of the National Agenda Committee and, and what, what that can and should look like. So just really quickly, what is National Agenda? Um, national Agenda was grassroots activism and uh, even taken from the original document, it's a vision and a plan of action. And that's what it was uh, intended to be. Um, that grassroots act activism, as uh, Brunhild pointed out, really got the attention of uh, the Office of Edu the US Department of Education. Uh, and in fact, uh, from the original foreword, there's the quote of these goals stand as a hallmark of what we want for our children because they are the same things we want for ourselves. We can expect, oops, my typo, no less. And that was Judith uh, Human, who at the time, 1995, uh, was the Assistant Secretary of the US Department of Education, Office of Special Education and Rehabilitation Services. So the original committee um, included Dr. Ann Korn, Dr. Phil Hatlin, Dr. Kathleen Huebner, Frank mm -hmm. Bryan, and Mary Ann Stiller. Kathy, and, can I interrupt you for just a second? Yes, ma'am. It looks, so your presentation is in the very small box at the top, and we are all just seeing still you on your webcam. So I don't really? know if there's a way to swap that out, or, I mean, if you want to keep going as is, that's fine too, but I just wanted to make you aware that people cannot. It this. shouldn't be. Um, let me see what I can do with this. So, did that change anything for folks? It did not. Um, somebody said something about dragging the panel down. So, Catherine, I had, this is Penny, I had been seeing your PowerPoint. It was, it was showing for me, um, but right now all I'm seeing is your screen that says Zoom on it and your, your desktop. So, let me try that again. Okay, so I just double clicked on this on the little small uh, presentation for anyone that was having trouble with that. If you double click on the screen that you want to look at, it should show up. If that makes sense for everyone. Um, it, yeah, double click on the smaller presentation. And Catherine's um, presentation is available um, from the Dropbox link that if you wouldn't mind putting back into the um, chat box moderator and Catherine will do a great job of reading her slides. I know she will. It's a short yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I just, I thought I would. No, go. it's good. Thanks. That, I, I appreciate it. Um, okay. We do want to make sure people can see stuff. Um, so we had the original steering committee and that leadership. And then I think as we all know, um, national agenda was revised in 2004. And that had slightly different people involved at the time. Um, and those authors included, again, Kathleen Huebner, Brunhild Merck-Adam, um, Donna Stryker, 
and Karen Wolf. And the reason I wanted you guys to know who was involved is, um, you know, to, to help you understand. Uh, this was a diverse group of professionals. Um, and it's, it's people who are, are very well known in our field. Originally, there were eight goals, okay? And then in the revision, they came up with two additional goals. But what we know is the 10 goals were all intended as national strategies. Now, that was one of the really groundbreaking things about national agenda is it wasn't just focusing on what I'm doing in my little silo. It was what do we need to do as a field nationally to ensure that our, our kids, our children with visual impairments, all of them, are, were making progress and to the best of their ability, um, able to transition into a successful adult life. So part of that process, of course, is referral. There's a goal for referral. There's a goal for parent participation. There's a goal for personnel preparation. There's a, a goal for the provision of educational services for this population. There's a goal along the lines of the array of services. Um, there's a goal for assessment, a goal for access to instructional materials. There's a goal for core curriculum, which of course we all know became the expanded core curriculum. There's a goal for transition, and there's a goal for ongoing professional development. So the transition, the ongoing professional development came later. Um, it's really important to understand that, that this is a, a living committee. It's a, it's a living document. Uh, the world changes. Our, our um, understanding of what kids need in reflection to that changes. And so uh, it, it is conceivable that this national agenda work might also need to continue to evolve. So the last actual substantive work that this committee uh, was engaged in was the UEB transition, which of course wrapped up in 2016. And, and the question becomes, um, does the field still need a grassroots, ad does the field still need grassroots advocacy for our kids? And to that end, that's why I conceived of putting this discussion on current events into this particular meeting this year. Um, you know, we've been, we've spent a lot of time so far at this, uh, meeting talking about the impact of COVID-19 on education for children with visual impairments. Um, you know, fast forward, we have the group under Dr. Rosenblum that uh, is the access and engagement examining the effect of COVID-19 on students birth to 21 with visual impairments, their families and professionals in the field uh, in the United States and Canada. Uh, you know, Dr. Rosenblum, Penny, uh, had a really nice session this morning and I had envisioned that folks might want to discuss some of that information tonight or this afternoon. Um, I've listed the uh, contributing uh, researchers with her. That's uh, Dr. Rosenblum, Dr. Tina Hertzberger, Dr. Tiffany Weil, Dr. Catherine Botsford, that's me, uh, Dr. Deneen Fast, Dr. Justin Kaiser, and we also had some great volunteers, uh, Leanne Cook, Michelle Hicks, Jasmine Nichols Grant, and the newly, newly doctored um, C. Rhett McBride. The other part that I wanna make sure people are aware of is this comprehensive evaluation of blind and low vision students during COVID-19 guidance document. And that was brought to us by the folks in California. Thank you very much, California. Uh, but uh, Yu Ting Su, Dr. Su was the chair of that, that committee. And um, you know, she brought together a pretty big group of folks, uh, Elizabeth Barclay, Catherine Botsford, Nicholas Casey, oh gosh, I'm so sorry if I butchered that. Uh, Monique Coleman, Stephanie Herlick, Vanessa Herndon, Amanda Mc Okay, Kicker, 
sorry about that. Um, Mary Nguyen, May Nguyen, Amanda Lewick, and Sharon Sachs. Um, so again, really diverse groups of people working together to solve problems. So both of these works were in their own way, grassroots efforts to get at answers and potentially solutions for our kids. Um, when we think about that, with the National Agenda Committee's last substantive work being on the transition to UEB, um, I think we can make the argument that COVID-19 is showing that there's still a need for grassroots advocacy for our kids. Another area of potential conversation today could be looking at what a revitalized National Agenda Committee could address or should address. I I'd really like you guys to think about that and please let leadership know. Um, you know, reach out to university folks, reach out to um, Cosby, reach out to AFB, APH, um, Perkins, Lighthouses, any number of, of groups um, who really have an interest and a stake in successful outcomes for kids with visual impairment. Um, with that, I was hoping we could open it up for discussion on any of those topics. And that would be that that was really the plan when I thought it was going to be a dozen people in a room. And to do that, you can, you have some choices. Uh, you can raise your hand. And if you choose to raise your hand, um, you can speak. Uh, our, our, our moderator can actually give you like speaking privileges if that makes you comfortable, or you can type things into the chat box and she can read those for us. So Catherine, this is Penny Rosenblum, and while we're waiting for the, the first um, hand to get raised or the first uh, question to get in the chat window real quick, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Access and Engagement um, study, we ended up with survey results from 1,432 individuals, and of those, 1,028 are professionals and 455 are children. Now, the children didn't actually do the survey. Um, family members did, but we have data for 455 children, 1,028 professionals, and these data were collected in mid-April to mid-May, looking at how COVID-19 is impacting students. And if you follow the link in Catherine's PowerPoint, you can get the access and engagement report, um, executive summary. The report will be out at the end of October. And most importantly, um, but we, I definitely want to talk about the advocacy with this report, but I also want to just make sure I do my, do my commercial to let everybody know that we are going to do an access and engagement too, beginning at the end of October. So we really want folks to help us get the word out when that survey releases. So hopefully by now we have a question, so I'll quiet down. So the other document that is linked for you guys is um, the evaluation of blind and low vision students during COVID-19 guidance document. Um, Ting, did you wanna say a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I just popped the link into the chat and uh, you'll notice that when you click on the link, it brings you to uh, actually download a copy of the Google Doc and um, the document was shared in this way so that anybody can download the copy. If you work with an organization, you can update it for your local needs or trends. Um, you can take our logo off and put yours on it. So it's really meant to be a living, breathing, open source document um, that everybody can use um, to inform whatever needs you have in your, your areas. And did you want to maybe talk a little bit about why you, why you took that leadership role? Yeah, sure. Uh, basically, uh, you know, it was in, in springtime when everything happened, everybody was scrambling to, to just survive the rest of the school year. 
And in August, with the beginning of the new year looming um, and understanding that we were going to go into a kind of a new new format of teaching, learning, and assessment, um, a lot of people were contacting me um, asking for guidance. Um, so for those who don't know, I coordinate the TVI program at San Francisco State. So a lot of my former students were contacting me. Um, teachers of the visually impaired in the area were contacting me. And I realized that um, we as a field just needed some guidance. Um, so it just so it was a, a lucky um, set of circumstances where uh, Stephanie Hurlick from the California School for the Blind forwarded me a similar guidance document from the California Association of School Psychologists. So I looked at it and I thought, well, this is great. And I, you know, this is exactly the type of guidance document we need for our VI field. So I reached out to um, CASP, that's the California Association of School of Psychologists, and asked if they would mind if we um, took their document and updated for our needs. And they said, absolutely, 100%, go for it. Um, so the credit really goes towards um, the School Psychologists Association for um, crafting this document to begin with, and then also um, you know, having that spirit of collaboration to allow us to adapt it for our needs. So it's also in that same spirit that it was um, shared. Uh, and so, um, of course, it, it really needed a joint effort because California School for the Blind has their assessment team that provides statewide assessment services. Our other VI program in the state is Cal State LA. And so um, as a grassroots advocacy effort, um, I think it's also important to have a team approach to, to crafting these sorts of things. Awesome. So there are a couple of comments, which is awesome. Thank you. Um, Roxanne Balfour wanted to know how it was determined what states or areas would receive the survey. Hi, thanks so much, Roxanne. Actually, it was a national survey in the US and in Canada. We had 20 collaborating organizations and companies. So um, people were tweeting, Facebooking, emailing their constituents. Um, so I can list off um, the collaborators, probably not all off the top of my head, but of the ones you would typically think of, APH, ACB, uh, Perkins, uh, TSBVI, no. I'm just drawing a blind, Humanware, Vespero, Objective Ed. So um, we feel like we did a really good job of getting the word out there to folks who were connected with online life. Where we did not do as good a job is folks who are not on the internet. So families that don't have internet, don't have a device, might really be spread so thin that sitting down for 30 minutes to take a survey isn't in, in the realm. But we hope this next round, and we're encouraging everybody, if you would reach out to one family and offer to support them in doing the survey, whether that's entering their information as you read the questions for them, whether that's reading their kids a book online so a parent can step into another room and really focus on the survey and you can provide a little bit of childcare virtually, whether that's being available so as the family's going through it, if they get stuck on, you know, I don't know if my kid has an abacus, what's an abacus, you can answer questions for them. But everybody had the opportunity. Thank you. Awesome. Um, there was another statement um, from Lana Mason. Um, and she says that moving forward, it would, be a, it would be great to have the national agenda meeting via Zoom or a similar platform so that we can truly have nationwide involvement, which is, I think that's a great idea. Um, Boone Hills, Mark Adam wrote and she says that it's important to remember that the national agenda is a partnership of parents and professionals and that COVID has shown us how important this partnership is. It seems that now we need to move the national, sorry, it seems that now we need to move for national guidance for state needs. The national agenda can provide support to disseminating information and resources for states to implement according to their needs. So along the lines of um, what what Ting what what Ting was doing, you know, you guys sent that out, or you, thank you very much, you and uh, Adrian sent that out to Cosby. Um, you've posted it different places. Is that correct, Ting? Yes, that's right. Uh, and everybody, you know, kind of shared in the labor of sending out sending it out. So it was disseminated to. Um, representatives from all the blindness organizations and everybody was encouraged to further disseminate out through their networks. 
Awesome. Um, Adrian, Adrian says, uh, Adrian Amandi, sorry, says, thank you for the shout out and the support ting. The California School for the Blind loves our partnership with SFSU and CSULA. <coughs> and then we had a couple of people who wanted to speak. Is that, is that right, Ad Adrian, different Adrian, sorry. Moderator. Yes, I am. There's, we've got two people waiting. I've added them both, added them both as panelists. I believe Emily was first. Um, yeah, hi. Oh, go ahead, Grant. You can go first. I'm sorry. I thought, uh, uh, thank you. Hey, Penny, I was going to ask you this morning um, whether you envision a permanent post-COVID hybrid of delivery of services specifically involving remote services? And if so, how can we proactively anticipate and address the needs that would be inherent in such a model? I mean, obviously the work you're doing now is the setting the cement for that. But. You know, this is, this is my personal opinion, but when I think about, and Catherine's on, uh, Catherine Botsford's on here, Ting Su's on here, Lana Mason's on here, and I think about us university folks who before COVID were already doing hybrid instruction much of the time. Many people who work, whether they're working in a building or they're working from home, are going to virtual meetings like we're doing today. If we're gonna prepare our students for tomorrow, they have to be strong tech users. They have to be able to, um, engage in multiple platforms of learning. Even when I go and I, I pre-COVID was volunteering in a class in an elementary school, and even when I go in there, the kids are on iPads, the kids are on computers. So <laughs> they might be in the same room with the teacher, but they're, they're having to use technology. So I don't think hybrid models are going away. How much they're gonna be part of, especially our elementary school models, I think is really, um, to be determined. But as far as the skill sets that our students need and the way we as professionals need to support our students, um, these models are going to be here to stay. Thanks. Thanks, Grant. Nice to see you, hear you. <laughs> okay, who's up next? Well, this is Emily uh, Coleman, and uh, I'm just totally stating the obvious here, but um, you know, talking about what we should be discussing moving forward, it's so in our face right now, the tech divide for our students. And, you know, when um, I had a conversation with Ting, I think it was in like February, um, and it was the first time I had really thought about how delayed our kids are in accessing any kind of technology and how they're kind of put off. And um, when all of them got sent home with all of their peers, and we quickly realized they didn't have the skill set. Like, I mean, when they're not in a classroom with either a parrot at their side or a teacher constantly checking in on them, um, I, you know, they're not as independent as sometimes we like to think they are with tech. So, you know, I think that's something moving forward, whether kids are re learning remotely or in the classroom, it's a tech environment now and um, it's changing so fast, but I think really having some clear, understanding of what that means for our population would be incredible. Thanks for that comment. We have some more things popping up in the chat box. Um, Rebecca Sheffield. Rebecca Sheffield says there are many shared interests between the ongoing grassroots advocacy on national agenda topics and ongoing advocacy for the issues in the Coswell Macy Act including the need for better data and the value of a potential national center for research and personnel preparation. Nice, nice plug. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, yeah, and, and so I think that kind of brings me back to this idea of what does this group, what does this body want national agenda to look like moving forward? What, what tasks do you see this group um, helping helping with or or facilitating. So the next person who's raised their hand is Brunhild. Awesome. Thanks, Brunhild. There is a little there's a little delay between the hand raising and the speaking. 
Kind of, yes, I'm adding people along as they as they raise their hands and trying to keep everybody in order. Um, okay, Brunhild may may have had to pop she out. She might have stepped away. Okay. Yeah. So next would be Adrian. Amandi. Right. So I have also. Chris Fendrick, who's raised his hand, or her hand, sorry. It's Alt A to unmute yourself if, if um, participants have that privilege. Do you want to move on to the next person on the list? Sure. Okay, here's brain help actually, right? Awesome. Okay, I'm back now. Sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to say that part of the conversation also needs to be that in the past, our model has always been that we've had national goal leaders for each one of the individual goals. And now it doesn't seem like we need to be focused so much on you know, getting the message out and getting that done and having an established entity in each individual state. It seems like we now have a more universal understanding. And at, at this particular point, we probably need to not be so focused on those individual goals and really figure out what it is that we need to do nationally for all of our students separate from those goals of what we have just seen now with this COVID thing. So that comment about the um, technology needs is like a key thing. And there are so many um, parents and families that are not having an understanding of what these issues are. So in addition to the resources for the field, we also have to develop resources for families so that they can partner with the professionals. And whenever we have this kind of an issue, then there's already an infrastructure in place for them to, to move forward from. Thanks. Thanks. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, this is Chris Bendrick. Sorry, I was trying to unmute on my voiceover. Anyhow, um, Penny and Ting, following your great research and everything, um, you may have seen my uh, very unscientific, but data collection for transition age youth that I'm going to be speaking about tomorrow um, because I really see in our field, especially when we get to high school age and moving forward, uh, working from home, more work opportunities, those kind of things with the advent from COVID, is, is that going to be addressed in this next round of study and looking to see how we bounce back after May? and through the summer and now that we have other direction? Um, so really we're, I don't, I, don't want, I don't know if we know that we've bounced back. And I think that's really the first question um, that Access and Engagement 2 is gonna look at is where are we now? Um, one of the statistics I shared this morning that to me is the most um, concerning or one of the most concerning is of the TVIs who responded about having a student in on some form of online education, 85% of those TVIs reported they had at least one student who was having an access issue due to their visual impairment. Um, is that still occurring today? Um, where are we with the, the digital divide? And um, I'm thinking to myself right now, as soon as I get off of the Zoom call, I just thought about a half dozen questions to write about that um, digital divide. Um, because, you know, we only had a few families whose child was in transition in the, in the spring um, respond to the survey. By and large, most of the children were in the younger bracket, which is not surprising to me. So right. I don't think we can really know yet um, where we are, and that, that's part of the purpose. If you have some suggestions of questions, Chris, we're looking to finish up the survey early next week, you're, you're more than welcome to email me or anybody else on the, on the research team with some suggestions that might target specifically transition. Thank you. That'd be great. Thank you, Penny. So in the chat box, Kay Ratzloff uh, had a question. 
or a statement. Uh, she says, on the instructional material side of te the tech divide, we need to also address, oh, oh, gotta go back up, gotta go back up. Uh, we need to also address the accessibility issue of the online learning platforms and digital materials. Yeah. And Ting says 100% she agrees. We know so we need some sort of model procurement policy with accessibility language that can be shared with districts or IT administrations. Um, you know, we, we, we did do some of that with the NIMAS NIMAC work in asking people to make sure that when their districts are um, procuring new textbooks, that they make sure that that, that language is in there so that they get e-copied. That, that was old, but it could be similar. This is Penny. I'm going to just jump in and say um, one of the things Catherine and I were with um, several of the other uh, researchers this morning for a couple hours working on survey questions and we came up with a list. We're up to, actually up to 25 items that um, we know about and we actually just posted on our Facebook TBI O&M group to ask about what tools um, professionals are using or students are using, whether they're using them with a TVI or an O&M that are not accessible. And uh, our list is huge. Um, several tools I personally have never experienced such as Seesaw. Um, so we do in this next round, really want to look at this issue of accessibility, not just our do you have students who are having trouble or family member, do you have a child who's having trouble, but what specific tools and then a uh, question asking you know, to describe the challenges with that tool and what solutions, if any, have um, come up. So we hope to be able to gather that data this fall. Thank you. Moderator, do we have, uh, did we have anyone else who wanted to speak? So I have another person that's just raised their hand. I have, I have another point. I wonder if y'all could comment. Um, the parents of my students fall into, I would say, two distinct categories. Those who are adept with necessary technologies and those who are, well, frankly, intimidated. Yes. So Grant, here's the deal for the access and, and, and engagement. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Grant. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to, no, please comment on that. Thank you. I, there was Penny Rosenblum, and I was just going to say, we, we, for this access and engagement survey, got the parents on the high end of the digital divide. Um, and if we're going to be able, as a field, to advocate for our students who are on that other side of that digital divide, and their families, we have to better understand what the challenges are for the children and for the families. Um, we had TBIs and o and uh, specialists in the survey who commented that they themselves needed technology training. So how do we ensure that our professionals have the skills and the ability to troubleshoot before then they're trying to support children and family in doing that? So we already have a digital divide among our professionals that's getting exacerbated. I can't say that word today, um, but it's getting more light shown on it um, through COVID, not just for our children, but also for our professionals. And Grant, I do apologize. I'm terrible at cutting people off in person. I'm worse on Zoom. So I'm actually just, I don't know if Kay was able to say what she meant to earlier just in the chat, but Kay, had raised your hand and also we have Shannon Pruitt that is waiting to speak. So Kay also uh, in her um, in her in the chat added that they're looking for an accessibility rubric to share with school districts to use when they're in their selection process and asks if anyone has something that is user friendly for the non VI educator to please share. Um, Rebecca Sheffield added, I hope that the data being collected will be included in letters or uh, other advocacy to the U.S. Department of Education. The guidance from the department on accessible materials and on serving students with visual impairments needs to be updated to answer many current issues, technology especially. 
Hey, this is Shannon Pruitt. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Hey, um, one thing I just wanted to comment on and add that may be helpful is, um, is I work in North Carolina and I, this is specific to the school district I live in, but um, a few years back in a money saving attempt, they cut all our funding for textbooks. So <laughs> um, what that left with is a lot of teacher created materials. And so the biggest problem I run into is is not necessarily, you know, the textbooks. I'm actually really happy when we have a class that has a textbook, but um, is is running into teacher created materials that are not accessible and that could be made accessible fairly easily just by following, you know, general guidelines for when you create a Word document, adding alt text, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, so I find the, the general ed population of educators aren't familiar with this and I know that's not necessarily we always have something over control of but with everything that's happened digitally you know I would think that's something that needs to be emphasized more um, with with people is making sure that the materials they create are accessible um, as well as um, you know how to do that that's, that's been a big problem for me. Um, and, you know, like I said, most of these are easy fixes, but um, in, in the time of COVID, asking a teacher to do one more thing isn't very, isn't always accepted very well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I apologize. I, I skipped one of the comments in the chat. Um, Joshua, and I'm going to say Erzik, uh, noted that the technology divide is a huge issue but also dwindling population of teachers and providers that we are seeing few teachers with higher and higher caseloads. And Brunhild posted that, uh, that we're recruiting for co-chairs if anyone's interested. And asking the steering organizations to appoint new members to the steering committee. Yeah, as part of the revitalization. Yes, yeah, so that's like a huge thing here. Um, again, it's, it's a grassroots effort, but grassroots efforts are more effective uh, if, if there's actual leadership within that. Um, and working in partnership with the original organizations who came together to create National Agenda Committee um, and having those uh, partners take a seat at the table with us and help us figure out how to address some of these issues, how to target, um, how to disseminate, uh, that, that would be super, super helpful. So again, um, if you value this committee and this work, it would, be, it, it, it would go a long way to facilitate its um, revitalization if you could speak up and get uh, folks back to the table. It looks like you have your first two volunteers. Maybe it would be helpful if folks want to be contacted for future national agenda work, if you'd also include your email address and um, if somebody could capture those. Yeah, and Brunhild will take, she'll, she'll, she will collect that. Great. I, I do want to just briefly, um, Joshua, first off, nice to see you. I hear you again. Um, but I think the, the shortage of, of professionals obviously is, I mean, decades old for, for us and having spent 25 um, plus years in, in personnel preparation, um, a topic very near and dear to my heart. But I think um, one of the things that might help us uh, is the idea of using tools like the Access and Engagement Report to help uh, not just like, you know, let people in the vision world know about this, but let people outside of the vision world know about the challenges and successes feeling, uh, facing our students and professionals now and helping educate people about what we do, why it's so necessarily, why we need manageable caseloads. One of the things we heard from several O&M people who took the survey was, I already had enough trouble trying to get people to know what I am and what I do and, and you know, that I'm just not you know, walking around the school campus for the sake of walking around. But now how do I help explain to administrators why 
it's so important that O and M continues. Why I need PPE to be able to then get with my students. So we can definitely um, use the data to to help elevate our causes on so many levels. And Rebecca Shetfield's comment about technology, absolutely. I just want to put in one plug and then I'll, I'll be quiet because this is a discussion that AFB is going to be hosting a three uh, three series town hall. The first one on October 22nd and the second one on October 29th will be focused on, on topics in our flat and inaccessibility report where we examined how COVID was impacting 1,921 adults. The topic on November 10th at 2 p.m. Eastern, so you might want to jot that day and time down, November 10th, 2 p.m. Eastern, will be about education and we'll be highlighting this um, study access and engagement. It'll be a dialogue. You'll have an opportunity when you register and registration will be available next week to put in questions. We also have an opportunity to put in questions in the chat window and myself, Tina Hertzberg and Tiffany Wild will be the ones leading that November 10th discussion. Thank you. Nice, nice plug. Nice plug, Perry. So there are lots of people saying that they're very interested in this work, which is super, super exciting. Um, Emily says that she would like TFBVI to participate, but I may not be the best person. Uh, as I know, there are others with more expertise. Uh, so keep her posted. Any other thoughts on, on topics? Oh, two popped up at the same time. Um, Missy Gar Garber, Gaber, sorry. Uh, I think that ultimately the solution will come down to professional preparation adjustments. We need to make sure individual TBIs and O&M instructors are strong in technology and advocacy for accessibility uh, with their districts. The technology itself will always be a moving target. Also, as a field, we need to research the effectiveness of some remote teaching methods over others and teach these methods in our personnel prep programs. Uh, Joshua again, thank you, Penny, agreed. The issue of getting the, need, the needs of our students to the forefront is a longstanding struggle, and we appreciate the hard work of all the prep programs in growing our field. We have more volunteers. And, and Penny said that she was your most welcome Joshua. And hi to your dad. I'm providing accessibility. Did anybody else want to comment or um, speak? We have a healthy group of volunteers. I hope you're getting those Boone Hills. So Catherine, maybe in the last few minutes, it sounds like um, volunteers are really coming forward. Maybe to change the topic a little bit and how can the volunteers work together, especially in our crazy COVID digital times? Should we think about setting up um, a follow-up meeting. Maybe we even could schedule the day and time before we leave here. Should we think about whether there are two or three key topics we want to start to really focus on and um, do some small group work and then report back to a larger group. But um, it's always great when you have momentum here at a meeting like this, but then um, it's always great if we can leave with a task list and a little bit of a plan on what's the next steps. I think that's a great idea. Um, Brunhild is going to be the person who is stepping into the main role um, moving forward. So Brunhild, are you still here? And and I, I don't mean to put her on the spot. She's, I'm here. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry, I, just, I was busy writing down uh, <laughs> okay. information. Um, I'm sorry. Um, yes, um, my contact information, I put my email in there. And I'll also give you my phone number, which is 
8065. I'll put that in the chat also. And I'll um, collect the information. We'll set up some type of a, um, of a way to communicate. Um, and probably I'm thinking that just for, for speed, we might do some kind of a Facebook page or something just to get started and then do something more official that's more functional. But that way we can kind of uh, uh, collect people quickly and get info out. Um, it, our website was at TSBVI. We'll have to look at that again. They were sort of our coordinating organization. So um, probably we'll need to have a talk to see if that's something that could continue to work or what well, organization. <laughs> AFB was the other one that was our, um, our coordinating communication uh, place. Well, we definitely have Emily Coleman, and she's the superintendent of TSBBI. So. I just don't want to put her on the spot right no. now. <laughs> no, but so so you've got the message out to her, so she's aware. Yes, exactly. And I'm going to follow up with her then. And yeah. then we'll see if that's the possibility, or we can uh, continue to have the conversation with AFB to see if they can serve as that conduit, because we need some place that we can uh, communicate. It's fine, you know, when we start off with a small group, but we want to get that message out for more people who might want to participate and share. And so we'll need something that everybody knows this is the go-to location to get um, updates and information. And then from there, we'll, we'll restructure the, the uh, agenda again to figure out how we communicate with each of the individual states. So we have some more comments. Um, Pam Chapin says it would be wonderful to connect first to three families to this important work for early engagement and advocacy. Uh, BBF is here to support. Woohoo! And she gave you contact information. Uh, Julie Johnson, I think setting a Zoom meeting to get started. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, Kay Ratzloff, it would be good to know how many students are receiving reduced time or no time with the instruction being provided remotely. And that is a question we were working on today. Um, and how are teachers keeping track of their efforts to meet IEP times? Uh, Roxanne, Michigan's multi-state VI teacher preparation consortium has grown 23 teachers in the past 10 years. But the challenge is always awareness of the field, uh, is awareness to the field of even knowing this area as an option to go into for teaching. Newly created support team to help mentor these new consortium students to help retention. So I'm uh, thinking, Roxanne, that you meant that as uh, like a, a way that national agenda could be helpful. Paul, Paul Olson made a comment earlier, and I lost it. Uh, but someone thought that they, they felt the same way. Oh, that's Penny. Um, Emily says that uh, our website is a hot mess in general. So but please reach out, though. And um, Jay Carson says, I would very much like to remain a part of this discussion, uh, at least as a follower and provides a, a email address. So we are in the last uh, five minutes of our day. Um, so uh, Brunhild, I also know you have been reaching out for a new co-chair. So typically this is done in co-chairs. I think uh, at some point there were two pairs, uh, two university folk and two parents. Um, Brunhild is, is the parent rep currently and she will need a new university co-chair. Um, at least one, you could, you could go back and have a couple. Uh, so if you are interested in working with her, let her know that as well. I'm going to make a little sweep through for more comments. Um, we have time for one more person speaking if you would like. or a typed comment. And I just, I, I wanna take a minute and thank uh, both Penny and Ting for stepping up. Like I said, originally this was kind of like, okay, we're just gonna have a conversation. 
so their willingness to actually uh, come back here and um, be willing to answer questions about their specific work, uh, I am deeply appreciative of that personally, and I think it really helps this session flow. So thank you. Um, Brunhild, can you put your contact information back in? Uh, it's gone up in the chat and, and it's now lost and people are looking for it. It is super exciting to see so many people wanting to re-engage with this um, and recognize that this is a, a really, uh, it, this is a vehicle that has the potential to be very effective in addressing a lot of the challenges that we're facing. So thanks to everybody for being willing to step up. Martin wants to know about your session. Is your, was your session yes. recorded, Penny? I don't know. I was just going to ask our moderator, are APH um, annual meeting sessions being recorded and will those be posted? No, this is no being idea. recorded. Yes, uh, everything I'm doing is being recorded as far as when and where it gets posted. Um, Leanne will have that information. Um, but I can, I'm sure. So surely there'll be some sort of email blast to everyone who, who attended. Julie Johnson uh, noted that it's I will, of them are. I will, um, I'll definitely put note that you were looking for this information, though, Penny. Martin was. And for those of you who are interested, Brunhild also posted her phone number for voice, voice messages. Thanks that she didn't need to be bribed to be here. Thanks. Thanks, friend. All right. Um, with that, we have three minutes left. Uh, I think we're wrapped up. Thank you all for being active participants in this. I, I know that uh, Zoom isn't always the most, uh, the, the easiest way to have a conversation, but I think that uh, we were pretty, pretty successful here. Oh, um, Michelle P says to increase the amount of new teachers in vision, deaf, hard of hearing, et cetera. The TEACH grant program provides grants of up to $3,764 a year to students who are completing or plan to complete work needed to begin a career in teaching. Rebecca Sheffield, thanks. Joshua says, thank you. I can go ahead and give the closing code for everyone's credits. And that is change. And I'll put that in the chat as well. Ting also pointed out that uh, California has a brand new Golden State Teacher Grant. And so you can come to San Francisco State with full funding. That was a direct plug. Good job. No, just kidding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sure it applies to all California schools. We have to be fair. It's all good. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Keep your eyes open for um, announcements about the town hall and the second round of access and engagement. I'm going to count on all of you to help us spread the word. Thank you. Bye. Adrian, thank you very much. Um, Brunhild, did you get everything you need out of the chat? I actually just saved the chat. Yes, I did. Thank you. Okay, but you saved the chat? Yes. Perfect. Oh, great. That's Perfect. even better. <laughs> just send it to everyone that was listed as a panelist. So you, Ting Su, Brunhild, and um, Penny? Right. I think I got um, removed when I knew that I had to step away a couple times. So um, I might not be on the panelist list anymore, but mine is in the chat. Yes. And I have you on, on Catherine's original email as well. So. Oh, perfect. Thank you uh, so much. Adrian, or Ad yeah, Adrian, not, not Adrian Amandi, Adrian, uh, moderator. Uh, uh -huh. I don't know if you saw in the chat, but someone said that the opening code was the same for the prison break session. So you, you just want to let them know. Yeah, I did. A, I actually had to um, correct that. So it looks like they missed my correction because I gave the correct opening code and the closing code at the same time. Um, so if I see that, I'll respond to that person and give them. So, it's, the, so she's, I think she's still here. I think Susan's still here. Susan, okay. Susan Dalton. 
see some dotting. Okay. So that's um, Okay, Susan. Yeah, so um, I made a mistake with that. I was looking at the wrong reference sheet that I made um, because this is my first time <laughs> doing um, this amount of involvement with Zoom. So that uh, the prison braille opening code was UEB and not policy. And Brunhild, you might want to type your uh, email in one more time for folks. And that's that's us, right? We're done. So I am attaching the text version of Thank you, Adrian. Thank you all. all. Right. Bye. Off to your next exciting session. It's going to be fun. All right. Okay, guys, I am going to go unless you need anything from me. Oh. Adrian? Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I heard oh. Is everything okay? Well, the, the way that the the chat came through is is a little strange. You might have to it's gonna be a little bit difficult to work through. It's just a text document, but it's very it's very wonky. Well, it also sounded like Brun Brunhild wrote down folks' information too, so. Okay. Awesome. Well, I will, um, we'll talk to you later. I see. All right, thank you. you. Are you in the APH now? Did I hear that? You did, you did hear that. I start Monday. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Uh -huh. All right, well, have a good rest of your day. Thank you, bye.